We didn't quite make it through network layer attacks last class, so I just want to finish it off with an attack on availability. Now, this is this is just a subset of attacks that I think are the most prevalent, uh, the ones that I covered. Uh, but this is by no means meant to be an exhaustive enumeration of all the ways you can get attacked. There's just too much to cover for me to do cram it all into one 10 week class. So the next most common thing that you'll see, and this is this is happening all the time, is distributed denial of service. And when we bring it back to the CIA principles, this is an attack on availability, clearly. Uh, so the idea of a distributed denial of service attack is to hijack a network of host machines and then launch use that network of host machines to launch an attack on a victim and what you would want to do as an attacker is say is basically extort the victim be like hey pay me money in bitcoin otherwise i'm going to point all of my bots to your site and then wreck your business so that's very compelling so you'd be like all right i'll pay you however much you want there uh, the problem with distributed denial of service is that the capacity that the adversary has available has just gone way up. And this is because we're shipping a whole bunch of vulnerable devices out there that nobody is patching or nobody is changing their usernames and passwords to. And so at the disposal of an adversary is just an enormous amount of network capacity. Uh, so that's, this is what we have. And this is an old graph. This goes to 2015, but it, it goes up higher uh, than that. So the most famous example of this, and I think this is what uh, you use, uh, I guess one of the data sets that you use is the Mirai uh, botnet uh, data set. So this is a botnet that was built out of a collection of default usernames and passwords for very common IoT devices, uh, home routers, you name it. They just collected it all up and they were like, let's try and compromise all of these things all at once. And that's what they did. They got a whole bunch of uh, compromised machines and then they basically operationalized that set of botnet nodes. So that's what happened. Uh, they used they use those default usernames and passwords to get a whole bunch of these things. And then uh, they use these nodes to scan for more nodes in order to build this botnet. And then they established command and control and operational control over these nodes. And then based on their operational objectives, they can point these to particular victims and take them off uh, offline. Okay, so, and you can see that this is one of the problems. When you have 9 million cameras that are out there, who's going to climb up and patch a camera? Every single one. Like if you deployed 1,000 uh, IP cameras and then you realize that they're all vulnerable, like who's going to go and, and patch every single one of those things? You're not. You have to basically throw away all of that and then reinstall it, and nobody's doing that. So then this is what we have instead. Okay. So this has been leveraged many times to attack things, and these are two of the more, the most uh, egregious examples of this. These are like the highest recorded DDoSs ever when they happened. One was on Krebs on security as, as retribution, uh, and then another one on GitHub. Uh, so this is just, you see these news articles periodically. Uh, this is a dis the bot distribution of Mirai. So you see the thousands of machines. So the bigger the, the, the bigger and the more red the box, the circle is, the more nodes there are. So it's just a picture. It's everywhere. Uh, and uh, when the when you direct this against certain sites, you can see that you can cause a whole bunch of outages. So level three is a uh, is a, an ISP, a tier one ISP, and they're like, yeah, when they do this, it clogs up the pipes pretty good, and then you get get places with outages. Okay, so that's the last attack. We are now going to talk about ways of protecting against all of these attacks that I just went through. So again, you want to, at the network layer, support confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Uh, the first thing I wanna talk about are the ones that protect confidentiality and integrity. So the first thing I wanna talk about is IPsec. Uh, and, the, uh, and again, the network protocols did not have confidentiality or integrity built in. Uh, there's neither of these two properties. And so the idea was in the late 90s was to try and implement security at the network layer. Now, this is at a different layer 
than implementing it either at the application layer or the transport layer. The idea is to secure the IP datagrams themselves. So at the packet level, try and build in mechanisms that allow you to do this confidentiality and integrity check. Uh, so you're basically attempting to add encryption and authentication on top of a network layer that has neither. And so the idea of doing it at the network layer is to enable any application to get encryption and authentication without changing them. That's the big thing here. Because you, uh, TLS uh, with HTTP, that only secures the web. But I have a whole bunch of unencrypted protocols that I just showed you in the previous class, like LDAP and, and all this legacy stuff that you're like, oh yeah, I, I don't want that over the, you know, in the clear over the wire. So this is a nice way of tackling that where you basically establish at the network layer encrypted uh, communication. Okay, uh, this turns out to be not as consequential with security being an end-to-end -end property. So yes, this does help you at that layer, but because on either side of this endpoint, like say you have a, an IP to IP tunnel, like communication uh, tunnel, on either side of that, you're decrypting and then you're sending in the clear. And so what you really want is end-to-end -end encryption where it goes from application to application rather than just within the network. Because this is very similar to the wire WPA, right? WPA is the wireless uh, encryption protocol that just encrypts from this laptop to that base station, and then it decrypts it and it's in the clear. So same thing, but at the network layer where it's IP to IP. And so if these two IP addresses are two routers, like intermediate routers, then on either side of those intermediate routers, you decrypt and then it's back in the clear. Uh, so this is why they're like, even if you are running IPsec internally at Portland State, uh, eventually when you get out of Portland State, you're, you're going to need to do TLS in order to make sure your connection is secure all the way to the end host on the other side. Okay, uh, this is just a brief overview of the architecture. And I just am showing you this to show you this is basically all the same protocol stuff that we covered in the uh, three weeks ago, right? They're basically doing a key exchange just like we had we have to exchange public key private key pairs we have to establish a symmetric encryption key uh, we have to establish perfect forward secrecy so they're using diffie hellman they're using perfect forward secrecy techniques in order to do the exact same stuff that we we're we saw with wpa and what that we saw earlier when we were talking about encryption protocols and authentication protocols and that's why i covered those initially because abstractly it's all doing the same thing but it's at a different layer. And that's what I want, the, the take home point of this. I'm not gonna go into details of how IPsec works because it's complicated uh, how it works and it's not necessary for you to understand what it's, what it's trying to do. Um, okay, so I'm gonna skip this because yeah, it, it's rare that you'll actually have to engineer IPsec. This is typically done in the infrastructure uh, in an ISP. So maybe if you work for an ISP, you'd be dealing with IPsec, but not if you're in a CS program, writing programs to use the network, you probably won't see this thing. Um, okay. This is more common, however, using virtual private networks and virtual networks to do confidentiality and integrity. Uh, and then I, I should say that some VPNs are using IPsec underneath. So, uh, but they don't have to, they can use their own thing. And in order to explain what a VPN is doing, I first need to talk about uh, the internet and how it works. Uh, and the internet, it was basically the first virtual network. Uh, and what I mean by virtual network is, is that it wasn't directly tied to a physical network or a physical implementation. It's actually a logical network. Uh, that can support a whole bunch of other physical networks on, uh, underneath. So this is what we're going to talk about. And uh, to motivate this, I'm going to talk about before the internet, which is circa 1974, where you had multiple disconnected networks that people were using. Um, so we had ARPANET, was a packet network, uh, and this was from the Department of Defense. Uh, so it was using packet switching to, to get uh, communication back and forth. 
Uh, you had this packet satellite network, uh, Aloha, which was just uh, wireless networks uh, bouncing off a satellite. And, and there's also a similar one with packet radio. Uh, and then you had the phone network, which was the circuit switch network. Now you have all these disparate uh, underlying real networks, and you wanted to internetwork them. That was the goal of the internet. Uh, and so all of these networks have different addressing conventions underneath, different formats of packets, different connection abstractions underneath, different ways of doing routing. So how am I going to connect all of these things up? That was the motivation for the internet. I was like, I connect all this stuff up and have one unifying logical network layer on top of this. And so you can see how that is virtual, trying to virtualize uh, and hide the underlying network implementation. Okay, so this was the paper that Vid Cerf and Bob Kahn wrote about a protocol for doing this. And I'm gonna give you this stick fig figure version of what it actually does, because uh, I can't, I don't have time to go through the history of this. So the idea is to internetwork and create a virtual network layer on top of disparate physical networks. And you, you want to create a homogenous layer so that the networking in between these two things looks the same. And so the idea is here you have two physical networks. At their edge, at the border, you, have, you establish this thing called a gateway that can basically communicate to either side of this. And then what you do is you implement an internetwork layer, the thing in green. And this internetwork layer is for any node that wants to interoperate with nodes on other networks. And that's what the green layer is. And you install software in the gateway to speak this green protocol and on any of the end hosts in these disparate networks. So that's the internetwork layer, the green layer. Uh, and then what you do is if you have a internetwork layer packet, say you're going to send from this machine on the left to this machine on the right, You'll take that packet and you will embed this into this local underlying uh, network format. So in this case, you're going to encapsulate that packet into a green, this, this light blue frame, right? And then send it from in this blue network to the gateway because you know it needs to go because this is your internet work router over here. And that's what you would do. And then this would go to the gateway, and the gateway is going to decapsulate this, pull out the, the internetwork packet, and then, and then look at where does this go. And it's a, it, you know, it's, let's say it goes to this pink thing, and it's going to take this blue thing off and then embed this packet into the pink. Uh, and then it's going to send this to the destination in pink. And then at the other side, this is going to get unwrapped, and then you have the green thing again. This is very similar to what we just talked about with the data link layer uh, and taking out the data link layer frame, routing the packet, putting on another data link layer frame and sending it across. And this is something very common in network protocols, right? You're embedding in a Russian, a Russian doll. You're, you're taking a Russian doll around a, a payload, sending it across. And then the thing on the other side is gonna take, it, take out that outer layer and then maybe re-encapsulate it with something else going across. Okay, so the underlying local network layers are now invisible to IP, that you don't see it. The green layer doesn't have to deal with, with anything underneath. Uh, and this is basically allowing all of these disparate network layers to interoperate if they just install this, this IP layer. Uh, and that's what the government did. The government funded a whole bunch of development to build open source versions of the internet protocol software. So BSD Unix, BSD Unix was the, the first one. And then because it was an open standard, everybody could implement it. And this is where you got widespread adoption of the internet protocols. That's just a brief history. Um, the reason why I'm covering this is that this pattern is everywhere in modern networks. This, this idea of virtualizing on top of something else. Uh, so, um, we're going to talk first about virtual LANs and using virtual private networks to implement these virtual LANs. And this is just one example of doing this uh, virtualization. 
And so one of the applications for this is if you want to do LAN emulation over the internet in a way that's secure. So here's a scenario. You have a corporate office on the right, this B, and then there's a branch office somewhere, say it's say the corporate office is on the West Coast, the branch office is on the East Coast. You want both of those networks to appear as one LAN, right? The machines on both, you want it, you want to. You want it, this thing to appear like a physical wire, um, even though they are on different ends of the country and they're connected in an IP network. So how do we do this? Um, one way to do this is to use this virtual LAN and LAN emulation by establishing these two special gateways. And when a, which is this machine over here, wants to directly send an L2 frame to B. Uh, A is going to, so say it's like a request, say A makes a request to B, and this, this is intended to be all on the same network. They have the same, say they're on the same slash 24, and you're trying to fake that across the internet. So this is the frame that A sends. Uh, has the IP address from A to B, and the L2 data link layer frame is also going A to B because they're pretending they're they're basically on the same internet network uh, logically. So this is the frame A wants to send to B. When A sends this thing, you have a special um, gateway here that is listening to this and realizing that the hardware address. Uh, the destination hardware address here that goes to B is actually over on the other side. And so what happens is these two gateways that are connecting the branch to the corporate, uh, they want to be able to send this frame over the internet, but encrypted, right? You don't want everyone to see this frame. And so it, they're going to establish this tunnel between V1 and V2. And this could be, this is an IP address to IP address tunnel. Uh, and they're going to send these frames directly across this tunnel. And so how do they do this? Uh, so this is the LAN frame that A is injecting into this uh, into the branch office uh, uh, part of the LAN. And then what happens is that this gateway, uh, V1, is going to take this and, and is going to encrypt and encapsulate this in an IP packet. And the IP packet has a source of V1, destination of V2, but then this thing is exactly this payload here that A wants to send to B. And then over this tunnel, this thing is encrypted, right? This frame is encrypted. And then when V2 gets this, V2 is going to pull this off, see that it's a data link layer frame, uh, and then just place this right onto the, onto the network in B. So that's, you know, you decapsulate it, decrypt it, put it onto the corporate network, and then this goes straight to B. So you're just like, you're, you're taking a Russian doll layer and you're encapsulating this thing and encrypting the in, inner parts of it, sending it over, decapsulating the, the, the Russian doll, decrypting, and then putting it right onto the network. Okay. So A and B now appear to be on the same LAN. And it's done uh, as a virtual, this is like a virtual, uh, physical wires, which you can see this uh, as. Uh, so that's just one way of doing this virtualization. OK. Uh, and then the responses from B are treated similarly. Are there any questions about this? This is just one way. Yep. Uh, that's the data link layer frame. So A, A believes that B is directly connected, right? So uh, when it looks at its routing table, it's like, oh, yeah, it's on the same slash 24. Uh, I am, I know I have an HTTP request, so I can just ARP directly for B and then send this frame over. Uh, and it's, it's all emulated underneath transparently by these two special devices that are basically at the data link layer, encapsulating things in IP packets, and then decapsulating this on the other side. Okay. This is just get to get you to the idea of that these packets, you know, I, I gave you that hourglass figure saying, oh, you have, have a application layer, then a transport layer, then a network layer, then a data link layer. Well, you could have, that's one way to construct that Russian doll. You can embed that into another data link layer, into another IP packet layer, 
these embeddings can be arbitrary, and that's how you build virtualization on on top of the internet. So they're treating the internet as a uh, as another virtual layer, and then building on top of that uh, layer. So this is just one example. Here's another example. I can do a VPN just using IP packets tunneled in other IP packets. So the, this, the previous one is I'm taking the data link layer frame and all of its contents and then tunneling that in an IP tunnel. I could just do this at the IP layer. And this is actually much more common uh, than the other, the other case. And so the idea here is that I have, again, I have a private network site. Uh, say this is the corporate site. And then I also have a, a branch office here. And then I put them logically in two different networks, uh, private networks. So 10.1 on the left, 10.2 on the right. And if 10.1.1.1 wants to send to 10.2.1.1, then as the router, you can have a router set up that uh, is, do, is handling the packets going to either one of these sites. And these routers have public IP addresses. Uh, and then on, on this side, it's 20.1. And on this side, it's 30.1. And if you have a private uh, address to private address packet, and these are two logical networks, you can take that packet and you can encapsulate it in this generic routing encapsulation header, which was one of the headers that I talked about in the last class where you can embed IP packets inside of other IP packets. And this is the case. You have an IP packet uh, from this network to this network, but in order to get it from this private network to this private network, I have to embed this in a header that, has, that goes from 20.1.1.1 to 30.1.1.1, and then I can send this across. And then it's basically tunneling this private, uh, these private addresses and this private IP communication inside of the publicly routable internet protocols. So that's what's that, what, what's happening. You're wrapping a network layer doll on top of around another uh, network layer uh, doll. Okay, now this doesn't have encryption uh, specifically, but you can add it. You can encrypt this payload uh, by adding IPsec around all of that. So that's that's how you can do both the tunneling and the encryption uh, so that nobody can see the communication going across these two private sites, even though they're using the public network to communicate their traffic. Okay, this is the basis for virtual private cloud. So the idea here is that, hey, uh, I have a bunch of infrastructure deployed in the cloud, uh, and this is a picture of AWS. Uh, and I want, because I have some data compliance issues where my data has to stay on site, perhaps, I want to be able to uh, seamlessly network my on-premise infrastructure with my cloud infrastructure, and I want to do it in a way that's secure. And so this kind of tunneling and encryption is basically what's embodied in this VPN gateway to make it appear that the customer on-premise private part of this, 172.16, uh, can be logically routed to the other private addresses in your public cloud, like the 10.0 slash 16. So this is common in the cloud, this kind of, and, and the way it's implemented underneath is via tunneling and encryption. So those two pieces. Okay, so VPNs are very common. Uh, some of the applications of this being used to bypass censorship so this is one of the common things uh, Chinese uh, citizens are trying to do to circumvent the Great Firewall of China. And this is why China basically is banning VPNs everywhere, uh, because they want to see exactly what's going across the network so they can filter it. Uh, so this is one of the things that uh, it's used for. Another thing it's used for is, so on the good side, it's bypassing censorship. On the, on the not so good size, uh, side, it's bypassing geofencing. And so one of the things that you would uh, want to do to, for example, we talked about authentication, how one of the four things that we want to use to authenticate legitimate access is your IP address and your geographic location. If you're an adversary and you're trying to bypass the IP address restrictions on logging in. So for example, if Portland State's like, 
nobody outside of Portland can log in. Uh, so it's a, an identity provider. It's like anything outside of Portland, uh, I'm not let, letting log in. And if you're an adversary and you're like, hey, I want to I want to break into this student's account, but I'm in, I won't name a country. I'm somewhere overseas. How do I do that? I'll just set up a VPN in the DALs or somewhere close to here, maybe in the PIDIC block. And then I'll I'll basically use that as the source of my access and then be able to log in. And that's geofencing, like bypassing geofencing uh, to do nefarious things. So again, this VPN thing, it's just a technology could be used for good and for, for not so good purposes. Okay, the next thing I wanna talk about, so that's confidentiality and integrity. The other protections I wanna talk about uh, deal with availability. So the first thing I wanna talk about are firewalls and network segmentation. And the idea of this is to limit availability to adversaries in order to make sure you have availability for your legitimate users. And that's what these two things are doing. So first, what, am I t uh, what are firewalls? Well, the analogy uh, comes from real life situations. So what is a firewall in real life? These are barriers, physical barriers, in order to confine fires uh, between sections of construction. So here's an example of a finish in a finished power station where this firewall around these transformers allow it so that if this thing catches fire, none of the other uh, parts of this power station are affected. Uh, this is an example of uh, Russian townhomes. And then you can see here, these are firewalls right in the middle here. And these are physical barriers so that if this middle section catches fire, you won't affect the other two sections around it. So that's the idea of a firewall. Firewalls in the network layer are similar. They're trying to block traffic in between two parts of the network. Uh, so if you remember in authentication, we had this castle moat model for security. Uh, that the, the way we implemented the castle moat model was through a firewall. And we're using this firewall to say, you know, certain traffic is just not going to be allowed uh, through the firewall. We're going to block all of that stuff. Uh, so this will be done based on a policy that the administrator is going to set. So this policy, there are two ways of identifying a policy. One could be a block list. You explicitly list all the traffic you don't want. The other is an allow list. Say, I only want this kind of traffic and everything else is by default blocked. So there's two ways of implementing policies that you'll find in firewalls. So here's an example. I have a wide open network. It accepts everything. So all TCP traffic across all of the, the TCP ports. So there's two to the 16th ports uh, in TCP and the same thing for UDP. And I have services running on all of these different, uh, on these three ports. This, uh, without a firewall, everything gets through, um, all the traffic can get through. And then what you would do with a firewall, which is in red, is uh, filter out certain traffic. Uh, so in this case, maybe only the Apache um, service gets traffic, incoming traffic from the internet. Uh, there are two kinds of firewalls. The first are the stateless firewalls, where the access control decision as to what, what traffic you allow through, uh, that's only done on the current packet. So stateless meaning that the, the packet in front of you, uh, what it has in it is the only thing you use to decide whether to allow it or deny it. Uh, this is a problem sometimes because if the, if the adversary has broken up his or her packets and fragments, you have to deal with that. You have to understand, like, do I let uh, all the fragments through or none of the fragments through? It doesn't track connections. So how do you know a specific packet is part of a malicious stream uh, until you see some data going across? And if, uh, if we'll, we'll, we'll actually talk about this in a little bit. Um, the other kind of firewall is the stateful firewall where the realization is that a single packet isn't enough. I actually have to see more of the communication to decide whether or not I want to allow that or deny this. And with these stateful firewalls, you're collecting, you're accumulating state and information over time, and then you're making your access control decision. And so this is based on historical context 
uh, not just a single packet. Uh, another thing about stateful firewalls is that you can implement stateful firewalls in two different ways. One is a proxy way where you're actually terminating the incoming connections and actually pretending to be the destination of that communication. And then if you allow it, then you will reestablish the communication to the legitimate destination and then send the data back and forth that way. That's the proxy approach. You could also do it in a non-proxy way where you're just uh, accumulating state uh, transparently and then just resetting a connection if the connection looks like it's malicious over time. Uh, an example of a proxy based uh, uh, implementation is something that we call web application firewalls. And this is something that we get we cover in the web and cloud security class, where these are things that are pretending to be the web server, uh, taking on your request, looking at it, and then saying, you know what, that looks like a SQL injection, you're not getting through, or that looks like a legitimate request you are getting through, is the idea. Okay, so firewalls can implement two kinds of filtering. One is ingress filtering. And ingress filtering, when you're, uh, when you're an organization trying to uh, apply firewalls to traffic, ingress means the traffic coming into you. Uh, so ingress to the organization. And you can filter this incoming traffic. So here I am on the right, this is my organization. And then the internet is over here. And then the incoming traffic can be filtered to only allow certain services. So the, one way of doing this is by service. So you're like, oh yeah, I like incoming SSH, but nobody should be doing Windows file sharing from the internet into my, um, into my organization. And that's what Samba is. Um, this is the, the, the Samba protocol is a Windows file sharing protocol. The other way to do the filtering is by IP address. So if I have a set of IP addresses, uh, that are allowed to access my network, then I can just add those as, as in an allow list in this firewall, and then everything else can be blocked. So multiple ways of doing ingress filtering. The other type of filtering is egress filtering. So you're filtering the outgoing traffic from your organization. And this would be something you'd want to do to like prevent data exfiltration, right? Like uh, outgoing... Uh, what is that site? Mega. Outgoing connections to Mega, which is like this uh, distributed file, encrypted file storage uh, service that, you know, basically if you have a bunch of data that you're trying to send somewhere, uh, it's a way of storing it without people seeing what that, that data actually is. You're like, maybe I should filter all of those connections going to, to Mega. Uh, so that's an idea of using egress filtering. Uh, and this is what uh, data loss prevention uh, products are trying to do. They're trying to do some egress monitoring. Um, one example use of egress filtering is to limit what a compromised system can do. So one of the things that adversaries do when they compromise a host in an enterprise, they immediately try and establish communication to the external command and control servers that the adversary owns. And so in this case, if you've compromised the host and you're using egress filtering, then you can filter out any destination ports that are not like the web, the HTTP port. So this is an idea. And then you force all of the command and control to be done on HTTP rather than these random uh, other ports that you, you might find. And you'll see uh, botnet command and control is all being done over HTTP because egress filtering will shut off uh, the other attempts to, to phone home, basically. Okay, uh, the other nice thing is that this prevents uh, an adversary from using this compromised host to frame the person that got, comp the organization that got compromised, right? Like if I wanna pretend my malicious activity came from this particular organization, if I compromise that host and source all of my attack traffic from this host, then I have framed someone else uh, to do that. And if you if you apply egress filtering, then this becomes a lot less useful to an adversary. One of the more common things is that if you have a host that's a web server that should never have outgoing SSH connections, 
you can apply that filter because one of the things that adversaries will do is they'll compromise the hoax and then they'll do SSH brute forcing in order to scan the internet for weak SSH usernames and passwords. And they don't wanna be found out. And so they'll use someone else's machine to do that scan. But if your firewall just says, you know what, outgoing SSH, not gonna happen for a certain set of hosts, you get rid of that, okay. So this is the saving grace for log4j. So uh, I've, I've used log4j before, but when this bug hit, people were like, this is a total disaster because this is like embedded in Java and nobody's recompiling this thing. This thing is there forever. And so what happened was they, th they thought Arm Armageddon, but it turns out we got a little less than Armageddon. I mean, there's a long tail here, uh, but it wasn't as bad because most organizations were actually doing egress filtering. And I'll show you why that, that uh, makes a difference. So in the normal log, so this is the, the legitimate log4j, you would send a request to the application server. So there's a web request. And as part of the application server, it's doing some logging, some better kinds of logging. And that gets logged into some backend database, uh, backend server, and then that's the intended use. And then there's no code execution here. Uh, the log4j vulnerability, if it, was, it has no uh, mitigations, this is the log4j vulnerability. I send you a special string that has a user agent that's basically encoding um, a serialized object that will cause code execution. If this vulnerable server logs this entry into some backend database and this backend database is basically processed, this payload will get decapsulated. And if you see in this payload, it's looking to make an outgoing connection to a rogue LDAP server. And if you see here, it, it, if the adversary has set up this rogue LDAP server, it can basically get code execution uh, and then data exfiltration through this LDAP server back to the attacker. So that's the vulnerability. And this, this is not getting patched anytime soon, and this is not getting patched anytime soon. I mean, people are patching it, but there are, there's a whole bunch of this, because log4j was built into a whole bunch of products. And so people are having a hard time even knowing whether or not they have this in their ecosystem, and they do, uh, and they don't know how to deal with this. Um, and so what, law, what egress filtering does is it whacks that, right? You need an exfiltration to this LDAP server, Nobody, I mean, if you have this outgoing filter that no outgoing LDAP leaves your network, you're saved, <laughs> at least from the easy, uh, the, the script kitty uh, versions of this. Okay, so that's just an example of this. Another very, really important use of egress filtering is to prevent IP spoofing attacks. So again, this is an a source integrity attack where because we trust you to write your own source IP address in your packets, you can pretend to be anybody. And so there is this uh, very commonly used, so um, BCP is, best is a best practice, uh, best common practice set of ISP rules for everyone to follow. BCP 38 filtering specifies rule 38 that says, don't let outgoing packets from your network out if they don't have a source IP address that you own, right? So prevent spoofing by universally applying BCP38 filters throughout the edge. And Portland State has a BCP38 filter that makes sure none of us can pretend to be like any other IP address than the Portland State IP addresses. Uh, this is also called ingress filtering because it depends on what your point of view is, what the ingress and the egress is. Up until now, ingress and egress was related to the organization. When they talk about BCP38 filtering, they're talking about network provider centric uh, view of the network. And so ingress means ingress into the network. And so even though this is egress filtering from the organization, this is ingress filtering when you talk about the, the, the network operator. And so you'll see this, this terminology gets switched. That's why. That's why this is called both ingress and egress filtering, uh, just for confusing. Uh, but I wanted to, to mention that. So here we are. We have a network. 
uh, on the right is the Portland State. Uh, actually, this is our labs subnet, 131.252.220.0. Uh, and then this is a router in Portland State saying, I'm going to apply BCP38 filtering so that all of my internet connections aren't, aren't being spoofed. And so if you are an organization that is allowing spoofed traffic, you're going to get an email that's, that's going to ask you, hey, you better do something about this. Otherwise, I'm going to start banning your, 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 your network traffic. Um, and so here's an example where this is a legitimate access, right? I have 120, 131.252.220.3, and it's being legit. It's, a, it's being truthful in that it's sending its source IP address to itself. And then destination could be anything. And so that, that filter allows that thing through. Uh, here's an adversary down here saying, I want to pretend to be 1.1.1.1. And in this case, this is where the BCP filtering is going to say, you don't own that. I don't own that. I'm not letting it through. And that's egress filtering from the organization that prevents this from happening. Uh, but what about packets spoofing other hosts on the same subnet? So it's, it's trying to attack the source integrity thing, but it can't do it perfectly, right? So it can do the easy stuff like 1.1.1.1, but what happens if somebody, one of these three machines sends this packet, 220.100? In this case, you have to do something more precise, right? Um, and one of the things that at least CAT does is like, hey, what are the IP addresses on particular hardware ports, switch ports. And then it you basically have to keep a finer grain directory of what should be allowed in order to do the filtering properly. Um, so that's what I wanted to. So you need to, you, this is allowed in a BCP38 filter unless you are doing it in a finer granularity is the idea. Okay, so how do you implement all this stuff? Well, on Linux, there is this thing called IP tables, which is an interface, a command line interface to the Linux packet filtering implementation. Uh, and this thing is generic enough that it allows you to implement not only firewalls, but network address translation devices, NAP devices. And as it turns out, because Linux is running all your home routers, it's basically using this style. It's, it's basically using this stuff underneath to implement your NAT device. Um, so the IP tables implementation or the packet filtering implementation, it can be stateful, it can be proxy-based, or it can be stateless. Uh, this is the architecture of the, the tool. So you have your, on the left, you have your network interface, and then there are these five chains. If you are implementing a NAT device, typically you would have this pre-routing, forwarding, and uh, post routing thing where you're gonna rewrite packets, uh, but you're not actually gonna send the packet up into the local host unless this is actually the web interface for your NAT device. And then you would send it into the input and output chain. The input and output chain are for packets that are destined for this particular machine that has this network interface and that needs to be handled by a process on this machine. So that's the idea of this uh, of, of these five chains, and this is what they're named uh, for you to implement whatever you need to. So here's an example. Uh, I'm going to add a rule to drop all packets from a particular subnet because this subnet's been very yeah has been attacking me relentlessly, and I'm going to apply this to the input chain so that my local process never sees traffic with the source address coming from this CIDR prefix. And that's why we covered the CIDR prefixes, because this actually is 256 addresses wiped out in one shot. Uh, and I'm going to put this, I'm going to append this to the input chain. So now this is where that filter gets uh, installed. And when a match happens, I'm just going to drop the packet. Okay, so you have this, uh, again, this can do allow listing, and it can do uh, block listing, both using a common language. Uh, here's another one. This uh, adds a rule to drop all outgoing SMTP traffic on the output chain. So say this, say this uh, particular machine should never be used to send spam. Like, you know, there is no legitimate use for email on this machine. 
you can put this filter that says on the output chain, if the destination port is the mail port, which is port 25, just drop it. And again, you filter all of that stuff out from your, from your outgoing. Uh, there are some alternatives to interfacing with the packet filtering rules. UFW is a more user-friendly uh, tool, uh, and it's only for firewall only. It won't be able, you won't be able to use this tool to implement an app device, but uh, if you're just using simplified firewall uh, operation for your for your uh, Linux, then UFW is is much much more user friendly, I should say. Okay. Uh, the other thing, so that was firewalls. The other thing I, I want to talk about is network segmentation. And the idea of firewalls is to filter traffic going to and from an organization. Network segmentation is filtering traffic within an organization. You want to compartmentalize your network so that uh, arbitrary machines inside of your internal organization aren't allowed to communicate with each other if, they're, if they shouldn't have to communicate with each other. Uh, this is intended to limit lateral movement after a compromise. If an adversary compromises a machine in your organization, you want to use network segmentation to limit where that adversary can go after compromising that machine. So this is what it is. I'm going to show you some examples of this. Uh, but before I show you examples, some of the examples use this terminology, IT versus OT. Uh, IT is short for an information technology. And when this is used, this refers to the infrastructure that your employees are using to do their jobs. So uh, your employees within your organization need to perform tasks, uh, and then they're, they're using the IT network to do those tasks. Uh, the operational technology network, or the OT network, is the infrastructure for your customers to use. So if you built, for example, if you have a web service uh, and you deploy it for customers to use, well, that's your operational network in the cloud, perhaps. Uh, and then your IT network is, I'm doing my development here at Portland State, that would be the IT network uh, in this case. And so your OT network is basically scaling up and down based on the number of customers, and it could be millions. Um, okay. Uh, this is uh, an interesting problem because it's often the case that your employees, they need access to the IT infrastructure, and then some of them need access to the operational infrastructure, right? They need access to both. Uh, so... Uh, the problem is, is if you allow just flat access, everything can access everything, you get you get something that looks like this. So here's a non-segmented example. I took this from the R4 IoT teardown, which happened earlier this year. Uh, here you have uh, the attacker's machine, and the attacker has figured out that this particular organization has this vulnerable IP camera and basically compromised that thing. So we talked about Mirai. It basically had a default username and password. So here it is on the IP camera. And then because you have not segmented your IoT network from your corporate network, uh, the adversary could just scan, do a brute force scan from this IP at, uh, camera over to find some Windows machine running a remote desktop. Um, and so if you did not filter this with network segmentation, you could basically uh, allow this, this camera access to your victim on the corporate network. And then the attacker is basically gonna uh, access the victim machine. And so this is called pivoting. The adversary pivots from the IoT network to the corporate network or the IT network. And then from here, the adversary is gonna basically explore to find a domain controller. So it's gonna use any number of means to scan the network, brute force credentials, uh, and it, it finds some credentials that uh, then allow it to access a machine over here that has access to the operational network. And that's what these uh, little PLCs are. Uh, and so this, then the adversary pivots from the IT network over to the operational network uh, after getting access to this domain controller. And then um, you basically allow this access. So you can block this if you properly segment all of this stuff. Like, should your IP camera allow outgoing RDP into your IT network? Uh, probably not. 
Um, and then this one, are you sure that this server should be allowed access into your operational network? So that's, that's where you would try and use segmentation to block this. Uh, here's another example. You have a collection of IT, IoT, and personal devices. So here's your, your IT devices, some printers, some IoT cameras. People are bringing their personal devices, like their phones, onto your network. Uh, you have this really um, sensitive server infrastructure over here. Uh, if you do not allow, if you have not segmented your network, then your IoT camera can directly talk to, to protected laptops of, of, organization, uh, of your employees. Uh, but then what you can do is say, you know what, I want to compartmentalize this. I'm going to put these on virtual LANs, like we talked about earlier, implementing those. And then I'm, going to allow, I'm not going to allow communication between them, right? And so these are color-coded. Uh, this is one VLAN. Uh, the darker blue is another. The green is another. The, uh, the yellow, your IP cameras, are another. And then the red one would be the fifth v, uh, VLAN that's not shown there. Uh, and then you basically block that pivot from the camera over to the laptop. So that's network segmentation. And you, as when you, if, if you ever do practice uh, this stuff operationally, this is the architecture that they're gonna hire you to implement to try and try and compartmentalize this thing so that if someone get, I mean, someone will get access to a machine inside your organization, you're making life harder uh, for them to pivot somewhere else. And if they try and pivot, this is where you can detect they're trying to pivot and then reveal that and, and patch whatever compromised machine there is. Okay, here it is uh, just a, a really common scenario in an enterprise. This is what you wanna do. So the HR department is the most vulnerable department in any organization because they have people who are the least trained in security and the ones that are most attacked. And they're most attacked because they're least trained and they have a job function that requires them to open up a whole bunch of unauthenticated payloads, right? They're getting resumes from any random source and they gotta open it. They have no trust uh, uh, established between anyone who's sending them attachments and they are forced to open them. And so like, I don't want my machine anywhere near an HR specialist machine. That's just gonna, actually I'm on the hiring committee of one of my, for our department and I'm opening up tons of stuff. And so like, I, like I need to compartmentalize that somehow. Otherwise, like I could be, you know, I could be the weak link in my department. Uh, and, and then maybe they want to compartmentalize me out of, out of the department network. Uh, but the idea here is that I have the HR department in blue and I'm like, you know what, this HR department, you better not be able to talk to the finance people. Right. Cause that's where all the money is. Like basically nobody should be able to talk to the finance finance people except the finance people and you want to compartmentalize strongly the network in green um so that's the idea and this is the common scenario for doing network segmentation if you don't do this then yeah one compromise will lead to complete jailbreak inside your organization now you got to be able to communicate between these net networks sometimes so there are exceptions to doing this network segmentation but they should be well known and they should be a limited number. And so one of the exceptions is something called a demilitarized zone or a DMZ, um, DMZ hosts and networks. And if you're on your home network and you want incoming connections to a particular machine to be allowed, because say, for example, you have a machine in your home that you're using as a game server, you wanna host games on. And so you're like, okay, well, by nature, that machine has to have access allowed into it, you'll put that in the DMZ. You'll be like, okay, I am gonna put this beyond the firewall and allow you access. And typically all of your public facing services for a company have to be put in the DMZ. So your web server and your mail server have to allow incoming connections from everywhere. So you would put it in a special zone where you can actually monitor that more heavily uh, and then allow access inside of it. Okay, uh, the, you could do this between the public internet and the private internet, or you could do it in between the, uh, the enterprise network on the right and the operational network on the left. And so here's another architecture for you to do that. And one of the things that you'll see in this architecture is something called a bastion host. So what is a bastion host? And this is terminology that you'll come across 
uh, in when you're when you're dealing with firewalls, what a bastion host is. It's a machine that is facing the public internet that it can be used as a stepping stone into other networks protected by the firewall. And so you see here, uh, the bastion host here, when you log into this from the public internet, you can use this host to, to, to traverse the firewall and get into your corporate network. And you can traverse this firewall to get into your operational network. And so they call it a bastion. Um, for bastion access. Um, and so why would you use one? Well, first, you need access to your OT and your IT network. Uh, and by establishing a bastion host, you have one machine to tightly monitor. And then you would log every single thing that happens on that bastion host. And when something goes wrong, you know where to go to look for where that thing, what, what, what happened uh, for that thing that went wrong. Uh, you also have this single machine to harden, patch, and update uh, in order to make sure that it's it's running the latest uh, latest software. And so, one of the really uh, one of the benefits of doing this is that this really slows the attacker down because the attacker has to find this host and then break into it in order before. Uh, pivoting into your infrastructure. Whereas if you didn't have this infrastructure, they would be able to scan your resources directly uh, that the Bastion host is attempting to protect. So here's a figure from AWS uh, where you would, so if you have all of your cloud infrastructure set up and you wanna be able to allow access into it so your engineer can get access to the infrastructure, uh, you can add a Bastion host and put it in a security group that disallows access from anyone else except the Bastion host users. And you could do some firewall filtering on this as well. Uh, and then that is the only place that is gonna be able to come into your actual operational infrastructure and modify it. Uh, so that's, this is just an example figure. Okay, uh, the next thing I wanna talk about is network intelligence. So what is this? Uh, the firewall and the segmentation rules that we talked about, they're about like organizationally trying to, given what your characteristics are, to protect yourself. The, the, the problem is, is that you want richer information to be able to make a policy decision as to what communication you allow. For example, I need to know who is connecting to me and what they've been doing. And if they've been pretty naughty in the past, I'm going to say no you're not gonna be allowed. That's what network intelligence is. It's like, can I figure out information about the person who is sourcing this connection and use that as part of my policy to allow or deny? So that's, that's the idea of network intelligence. You're basically doing attribution and accountability for the network traffic and its sources, and then using that to do a policy decision on top of your firewall and network segmentation rules. And this is basically defense in depth, right? You know, where firewalls and network segmentations are, are more on protecting the infrastructure you know, network intelligence is protecting against information that everyone else knows about the source of the traffic. Uh, there are two kinds of information you can collect. There's the static registry information, who owns the IP addresses, and so, for example, if Portland State allows unfiltered spoof traffic coming from it, and uh, all the other ISPs know, then they can be like, oh, Portland State is not trustworthy. I'm going to filter all of their traffic. And this is, this is what you can do with uh, attribution, right? Uh, you can trace where the spam is coming from and shut down that AS that is uh, sourcing that spam. Uh, network th threat intelligence is more of a dynamic thing. This is what, basically reputation information. Uh, that can either be from a proprietary third-party source or it could be crowdsourced. It's much better if it's crowdsourced because everybody has a particular view of malicious traffic that is that they're being targeted with. And if you share that information, then an adversary probing all bunch of networks with their maliciousness will get found out. Uh, and then you can use the crowd to say, hey, shut that person down. Like, don't take traffic from that person. Uh, he's already attacked, he or she has already attacked a thousand machines. Let, let's not make it a thousand and one. And if you have dynamic network intelligence that identifies that, you can shut down that activity quickly. Um, okay. 
Uh, so there are these threat exchanges that allow you to take reports from individuals, aggregate them, and then action uh, create actions based on uh, these reports. Okay, I'm gonna first talk about the registry information. So anytime you are allocated a block of IP addresses, you go to this organization, the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority, and uh, the internet, well, so you go to a regional internet registry and they have been given addresses from IANA. These regional internet registries are required by IANA to uh, force the providers that get addresses to register their actual contact information. So this is attribution that is being required from anyone operating IP networks uh, across the country. So that's the idea. And so this database, the database that these uh, regional internet registries have to, uh, have to uh, maintain, you can use this whois command to query it. And this is what you're gonna be doing in your labs. You're gonna be like, hey, uh, who is, this is the IP address of my machine. Uh, who is the organization that owns this IP address? This, this machine needs to do, uh, has been doing some bad things. And so it will be like, oh, this is for, coming from Portland State. This is the AS number. This is the range of addresses they own. Uh, and because this person has been sourcing this, that, and the other, uh, the, this is the contact. And you see abuse at pdx.edu is going to accept these reports. And this is where OIT then gives me a phone call and say, hey, what are you doing? And then I have to like stop what I, whatever I was doing. Um, so that's ha has happened once. Um, but that's that's the that, that, that's the attribution, right? That's how you get stuff fixed uh, that's persistently broken. Um, okay. The more interesting thing is the threat intelligence. So this is something that you have to do, and this is like for long-term abuse that doesn't get remediated. You're like, okay, uh, I have to go talk to an operator. Um, the threat intelligence. This is more of a real-time per IP address uh, collection of data. Uh, and so it's basically saying, where are the attacks coming from geographically? What exploits and payloads are being used? What are the indicators of compromise that can detect these things? So it's actually very broad threat intelligence. I'm putting it here because the examples I'm going to have you do are IP address based. They're not, they're not any of these. Like, I mean, some of these threat feeds have these two things. Uh, but for the most part, in your labs, I'm just having you do uh, you know, IP addresses that are known bad. Uh, that's enough. But just realize that this is why these companies are making tons of money. Uh, well, not not open threat and exchange, but like there are some open exchanges here. And then there are companies that are making tons of money with these intelligence feeds to give enterprises real time information on where the attacks are and who's sourcing them and what they're using this is very important. Um, so, yeah, there are some of the companies. I actually have two former students who are working with, at Anomaly. Um, who will sometimes come come in and give guest talks, but these are the these are the main names that you might come across for the proprietary ones. Uh, I'm going to have you do the open source ones. Uh, this is often part of what's called open source intelligence. This is just one part of open source intelligence, uh, and this, the acronym here is OSINT. Um, OSINT is much broader though, so it's more than just network information. It's about user information as well, uh, like. LinkedIn network information and those sorts of things. Uh, so this is just one part. Network intelligence is basically one part of open source intelligence. Um, some examples of the open source ones are the Open Threat Exchange, which was on the on the figure earlier, and then the FBI has this InfraGuard um, uh, sort of site that also is aggregating threats and and giving you a queryable interface to that data so you can act. And they have uh, the federal government has the best view of the activity going on because the NSA is like listening to everything and figuring out like, well, that, I mean, that sounds bad. Uh, they are, well, they are kind of, well, if it's not, I mean, if it's encrypted, then they're seeing it, but they can't do anything about it. But they are looking at all the threats. They are, their job is to identify how we're getting attacked and then taking that information and releasing it to uh, our, you know, individuals and companies so that they can protect against those things. And so they'll open up things like this InfraGuard in order to share the information that they know. And this is, uh, I think I said earlier, they're sharing information on VirusTotal because they want us to be able to protect 
against the emerging threats as well. So this is all part of open source intelligence that, that is happening. Um, so one of the sites that uh, you can use is ipinfo.io. And uh, one of the real nice things about ipinfo.io is that it has knowledge, and this is pretty stable knowledge. It has knowledge of whether or not your IP address is hosted in a data center, is a known VPN address, is known to be part of Tor, which is an anonymizing network, or is known to be uh, some kind of proxy or a relay. And so this is because the abusers often hide behind other people's IP addresses. And so they are using Tor to attack people. They are using cloud providers in data centers. They're starting up virtual machines, uh, taking the IP address that the virtual machine gives them and using that to go and attack everyone. And so as part of intelligence, you're like, hey, I don't want to accept any connections from any of these sources because I can't trust them. And so this is my, uh, again, my machine's IP address. And of course, I don't belong to any of these things. And this is valuable information for, for some services. Uh, here's one that I use, Get, Get IP Intel. And this is using some machine learning uh, techniques to determine whether or not this is an IP address that's, again, any one of these three things. So it actually folds in some reputation reports as well as whether or not it's a data center, VPN, or Tor proxy. And so this is the API that I use. Uh, you basically hit this URL with an IP address, and it gives you a score from 0 to 1. And anything above 0.95 means that it's a high likelihood of being a proxy or a bad IP address. And then anything, uh, uh, so then I give it the IP address of my Google Cloud virtual machine that actually runs all of my Oregon CTF.org sites. And you see this here, 35.233. Uh, times three. And then you see that, yeah, this thing knows that this is being served from a data center. And I use that because I run this uh, 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 Ropsten Ethereum uh, uh, faucet. I give free ether to people on the test network. Well, they shut this test network down, so this site doesn't work anymore. But as my implementation, I was like, hey, I don't want an adversary to just use a whole bunch of virtual machines in the cloud to drain my faucet, right? I only have like 100,000 100, ETH. And I, if an adversary could script uh, asking for this ETH, and then, then I just run it all the way down. Uh, but in order for me to limit that, I say, you know what? I'm going to restrict by IP address. A particular IP address can go only get one ETH per day. And then I'm going to say, anybody coming from a data center address or Tor or a VPN, I'm going to give you 0.01 ETH every time you ask. And then this is the code. I'm like, you know what? Uh, I'm going to just pull this number from, basically I'm using this as an API and I'm going to use that as threat intelligence to determine how my application is going to give you free, free money. Uh, so that's just an example. Um, so this is data center or bad IP. You, you could also do a reputation only lookup. I am only looking for bad behavior. And this is what this particular feed does, iplookup.org. So you do an iplookup.org on my machine's name, and I have re rehabilitated the reputation of this address. And so I get a thumbs up uh, from both OIT and this uh, iplookup.org. And then for that, again, OregonCTF.org, it was a proxy, but it wasn't doing anything bad. And so if you just want to do straight up reputation, you, you could use this one. And you say like, oh, yeah, this is uh, legitimately doing good, uh, not bad things. And then you can actually see its location. So on, you know, this is in Portland. That's actually in the Dalles. Uh, if you see the Columbia River going through here. So it, it has the, the location of that as well. Oh, I am going to talk about the last countermeasure that's commonly used. And again, this is also going to uh, address the availability issues from the previous attacks. Uh, and these are uh, content delivery networks or content distribution networks. Uh, CDNs is another term for them. Uh, and so the motivation of CDNs is to forward deploy all of your resources to locations near the people who are accessing it, right? And so this is basically a divide and conquer approach for making sure that the bottleneck for your users isn't a connection to a single server here. 
So again, if you have a ton of traffic and you have one server to serve it all, you have an availability problem. And this is what distributed denial of service is attempting to attack, right? Like if I put enough of these bots at this particular server, I'm going to uh, basically drown out this site. So the idea of a CDN is to forward deploy replicas of this uh, content across the network and then allow the clients to, to access the local copy. Okay. Uh, so you're transparently serving the content from a location that's right nearby on the edge of these, these uh, clients. So here's an example. The clients, which are the green, so the green threes, are attempting to access content from the origin server, but instead are transparently being served uh, the data from, uh, from basically forward deployed nodes in the content distribution network. So the thing in blue is your CDN. And these nodes are populated with original content from the origin server. Um, and so how does this happen? Uh, it happens by the content distribution network performing, uh, in some cases, a reverse proxy on this incoming connection. So the connection might be going from three to one, but something along the way is transparently terminating that connection, examining the request, and then serving it locally if it can. If it can't serve it locally, then because it has proxied this connection, it can then set up another connection to the origin server to get a copy of this content. And that's how the copy gets forward deployed for the next person who asks for the same content. Then as an adversary, if you're trying to DDoS number one, you basically have to DDoS an entire network of machines in order to get to number one, okay? So that's the idea. You can, not only use a CDN to improve the performance of your, of your application, you can use the CDN to mitigate attacks. So the idea is that if I'm gonna proxy this incoming connection, I'm gonna take a look at it. I'm gonna be like, well, what request is being asked of me? Uh, and if it looks like it's an attack, I'm just gonna say, drop it at the edge. Or if it's from an IP address that has asked me for 10 gigs of information in the last minute, or it says like 10,000 requests in the last minute, I'm gonna say, just drop it right there. Don't let it come to, to my origin server at all. And that's what the DDoS mitigation um, technique is doing. It's doing both. It's saying, oh, oh, you know what? This is a, this is a Mirai traffic, uh, drop it. I know these IP addresses are bad. I know they're infected. They should not be allowed to access any of the, any of the sites that my CDN is attempting to protect. So you as a content provider are like, hey, I wanna to subscribe to a CDN service that does this kind of filtering. And I wanna be able to control who gets actual access to me. Uh, so that's the idea. So there's a bunch of examples of this, Cloudflare, Akamai, Google, Microsoft, they're all making a killing here because you need that protection in order to make your business run, right? And they have built out all of their data centers in order to provide this piece of functionality uh, for people. Okay, so here's straight out of the Cloudflare uh, literature. This is general architecture. Uh, without Cloudflare, you have these slow pipes to your naked website, and the adversary is sharing that pipe with all of these other folks uh, that you want to actually respond to, your users, any of the search engines, you actually wanna serve those requests so that you can get into search results. But the attacker is also multiplexed here on the same pipe to your site. And so the idea with Cloudflare and uh, these other mitigating uh, services, these CDNs that do this mitigation, is to forward deploy all of those proxies. And so again, Cloudflare's proxy is sitting here in the PIDIC block. So they're gonna transparently, if, if there's a Cloudflare protected site and you're trying to access it, it will terminate that connection and proxy it and say, you know what, solve this puzzle before I allow you access, or I'm just gonna drop you because you asked too many times. Uh, and then it's gonna, my connection is gonna be dropped at the PIDIC block and not reach that actual site. And that's basically what you're seeing here. The legitimate visitors and the crawlers and the bots can get their requests forwarded. And then the attackers are dropped at the edge. They're dropped in that PIDIC block uh, thing. 
So here's another one, and I'm just randomly pulling these things. This is Azure's DDoS protection service that they announced, and you can do the same thing for, it's nice if you have your content deployed on a cloud provider, you might as well just use their mitigation that's straight up part of their cloud service. And this is why you would use a cloud provider uh, to do this kind of activity, because like you're not going to buy all the data centers to do this mitigation. You actually want to do that as a service. And so that's what Azure DDoS protection is going to do for you. And this is their picture, their marketing. The attacker is very sad here because they're, yeah, they're not being allowed, whereas the customers are being allowed um, through. So yeah, the attack, this is the attacker traffic. This is the customer. It's one, one pipe into this. It, well, and this is the edge. Uh, and then because at the edge, the attacker has been identified and dropped, then in your virtual network in the cloud, you only see the good stuff. You don't see the um, the attack traffic. Okay, now you're terminating this connection in the PIDIC block at the edge, but one of the problems is that, hey, the reason why we have HTTPS is to prevent this person in the middle attack, right? That was the whole point. Like I need, if, if, if I'm gonna have Cloudflare pretend to be me, say, um, say it's Portland State, and I'm having part, uh, Cloudflare pretend to be me, I need to give Cloudflare my TLS certificate, my private key, right? In order to do this effectively. That's a problem, right? Because I don't trust Cloudflare. They host Nazis. And I'm like, I don't wanna, I don't, I don't want you. They they don't take down neo-Nazi sites is what the what the problem the issue is with Cloudflare. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to trust them with my certificate. And I don't know if their operational infrastructure is legit. Right, like if I give them my my certificate that has my private key and they lose it, that looks bad on me, not on them. Like nobody knows that I'm using Cloudflare. Flare really, it's like yeah. But if I start, if my key starts being used because Cloudflare lost it, I have a problem. But I am asking Cloudflare to terminate my TLS connections up front, so that's a problem. Um, Okay, so this breaks the end-to-end -end security guarantees that we had TLS for to begin with. And this is a trade-off, right? You want DDoS resilience, but you want application security as well. And so what they have done, this is one solution to this. One solution is to take your TLS certificate and deploy it on key servers that you operate within Cloudflare's network. And this is one of their architectures. This is keyless Cloudflare, keyless SSL. You as Portland State are going to have to deploy on key servers in my network that you control your private key so that when I'm trying to do this termination, I can ask you to sign and to validate the keys that are being exchanged between the user and, the, and my edge device. So that's what's, that's what's going on here. This is a kludge, actually. It's like, yeah, there should be a better way. And it turns out there is a better way now. And that's what this TLS delegated credentials thing that was proposed is intending to do. The problem is, is that you have this long lived certificate that you got from Let's Encrypt, and that's intended to be secure and, and persistent, but you are giving, you want other people to sign for you temporarily. Like you're saying, hey, I have a relationship with Cloudflare. Uh, I want to be able to terminate it within hours or days and then have them not have access to my signing keys. And so what you can do with these delegated credentials is you can take that master certificate and that master key and use it to sign a credential that is time limited with a time that you control. And that's what a delegated credential is. And then you would allow Cloudflare uh, access to the delegated credential, and this would just expire after a few hours. So if you stop using Cloudflare, then within several hours, they can't sign for you anymore. And that's what this particular countermeasure is. Okay, other questions about using CDNs to stop DDoS and then the underlying technology that the underlying infrastructure you need to do this? Okay. So that's it. Those are all the mitigations that I want to talk about at the network layer for, for the CIA properties. Uh, the last thing in the network layer that I want to talk about is this ICMP protocol. So I've talked about routing and IP. 
the ICMP protocol is basically for error reporting and for router signaling, uh, for finding out locations of routers. Uh, and so that's what we're going to cover here. ICMP has a whole bunch of different uh, message types. We're only going to use two. The ping message type, which is a simple are you up? So when you ping a machine, it just basically will respond up or down. It'll, it'll respond up or you'll get no response, which means it's down. Uh, so that's ping. Uh, there's also a TTL expired that allows you to trace routes through the internet for IP addresses that you're sending to. Like what route is this datagram gonna take into the network? And you'll use this TTL expired field of the IP packet to figure out uh, you know, what route your packet is taking. Okay, so I'm gonna do the TTL expired first. So in the IP header, there is this time to live field and you typically set it to a maximum hop count, maybe 32. And then every time a router forwards your packet, it will decrement that TTL field by one. And then if it reaches zero, then routers are supposed to drop your packet and send an ICMP message saying TTL exceeded. And that goes to the client, uh, the, the sender of that packet. Uh, so that's the idea. And you can use this to discover the routes that your packets are taking and whether or not someone has hijacked that route. Like if you know your, your routes from a certain source to a destination, from yourself to a destination, you can keep on probing that to see if it switches over to some other route. So if you remember that route hijacking content, yeah, if you're persistently monitoring your route, you can see when it starts going to Russia and you'd be like, <laughs> I'm not going to send my password uh, through to you if you if that's what you're wanting to do. Okay, so the way you access this TTL expired uh, functionality is through trace route. Uh, and so the algorithm for trace route is to send a bunch of UDP IP packets with varying TTL fields. And then if you start it at one, then at the first top, the TTL goes to zero, and then you'll get a response from the router that dropped your packet. And they'll be like, oh, that's my first top router. Uh, so that's the that's the step. Uh, then you increment your TTL. And then you send another packet. And you're like, oh, the wherever it gets, gets dropped, that's your second hop router. And so on. And so the algorithm is to do three probes per TTL value until you get to the destination. So this is it. The first one, TTL1, send three probes. They get dropped, and then three ICMP TTL exceeded messages are received. And you can say, and with the IP address of the router that sent them. So then you have the address of the router, uh, and you have the round trip time to and from the router, right? I can keep track of when I send that packet. I can keep track of when I get the response, the TTL exceeded response. That's my round trip time. So I have two things in one that I'm getting here with this. The second one has a TTL of two. And so I get that that router address and then et cetera until I get all the way to the end. Uh, so the stopping criteria is that it eventually arrives at the end host or you get this host unreachable packet, meaning that routing failed. Like uh, that IP address is not routable after a certain hop. Um, so this is what you would get. I don't know if you remember that CIDR example where I had that ISPY with four companies that it was giving addresses to and there was one unallocated range if you sent a trace route to that unallocated range eventually your packet would make it to ispy but then ispy is like hey i actually haven't allocated that prefix i would just do one of these things on host unreachable and then send that back and then trace route would be like okay i'm done like i know my packets are going to get dropped at that particular hop um okay so this is what it looks like uh, you do a trace route of 1.1.1.1, and this is where you'll see it. It goes to Portland State routers, and then it goes to uh, the Northwest Access Exchange, which is the PIDIC block. And then 1.1.1.1 is basically hosted in the PIDIC block. Uh, the, the closest one is hosted uh, down there. And then you do a trace route of 8.8.8.8, .8 and you'll see that it goes all the way out to, it goes to, to the PIDIC block. And then from the PIDIC block, it has two hops to get out to uh, to the DALs. So there's two interfaces that it traverses. Um, one of the nice things about uh, traceroute, like if you turn on the um, reverse lookups, 
uh, for these IP addresses is that you can actually figure out the geographic location of all the routers that you traverse. And they're typically labeled by the airport code uh, of the city that they go through. So here you can see it goes from Portland to Seattle to Minneapolis. Don't know that one. Cleveland, Ashburn, I think it's North Carolina, Washington, D.C., and then finally Washington, D.C. to London. And then you can see the round trip times as you go across. And so you, you have basically this one is across the country, goes from 4 to 37. This one's across the uh, Atlantic Ocean. So you see the jump up from 59 to 133 uh, and so on. Okay, so I mentioned we're going to use Nmap here. One of the scans you can do with Nmap is the ICMP echo request scan. So I mentioned that ping uh, message. If you want to use ICMP to see if a machine is up or down, you can send a ping packet, an ICMP packet. And if the machine is up and will respond to that, you will get a message back. And that, that will basically indicate that, yes, a machine is there. Uh, so if, if you do an nmap-pe, that's what kind of scan you're doing. And so this is the, uh, if the host is up, you'll get an ICMP echo reply. If the host is down, or if this request is filtered, which is more often than not, you'll get no response. Now with this particular scan, you can't tell the difference between a host that's down and a firewall that's just dropping these packets. And so this is something that as an adversary, you're like, well, that's not enough information. I wanna see if there's actually, if, if it's actually a firewall or if it's actually a host that's there, but not responding. And these are different. This is why we have so many different scans because different scans give you different kinds of information. So this is not a very useful scan just because ICMP ping is not used very often or is, is filtered a lot. Uh, and so it's not used that often. Okay, are there questions about the network layer? I'm going to do a little bit of the transport layer uh, at the end here. I was going to mention on trace routes, a lot of times they just send you back, like you just get it like a star. It's yeah. Like so I should mention with the stars, some routers do not like handling ICMP requests or replies. So ICMP is a slow path operation in a network router. Network routers at the data in the data plane, that's all they want to be at. They just want to send data. And so if you have a router that says, I don't want to deal with ICMP, I'm going to disable that. Now that is for that hop. So it doesn't mean that your packets are being filtered there. It just means that the ICMP reply is not being generated at that hop. And so you'll see star, star, star for a particular TTL. But then the next TTL might actually get a response from that next top router. Now, at the destination, if you have a firewall that's filtering all ICMP, then you'll get star, star, star forever because you'll get no response from ICMP uh, just because as a policy, that firewall is filtering everything. Uh, and so then that's the third stopping criteria is that it doesn't stop. This is the way that's like, yeah. it's basically like, oh, I have to control C that thing because it's not going to come back. Or I can actually, the TTL goes to 2 to the 16th or something. Yeah, if you want to wait that long for it to, to stop, then you have to do that. Yeah, that's a, good, that's a good observation that I did not talk about, but I probably should have. Okay. Okay, so the next layer is the transport layer, and I'm going to briefly talk about the transport layer and how it's implemented, uh, and then save the rest for, for next week. Uh, so we talked about the transport layer as being logical communication between application processes running on either the client or the server. And this software is running on your, on your operating system, uh, typically. Uh, the sender is breaking up segments and sending it into IP, and then the receiver transport layer reassembles those messages and passes it up to the destination application. At the transport layer, we have TCP and UDP. Um, uh, the service that they both share is data delivery to an application protocol running on a particular destination port. And so you'll see for both UDP and TCP, there is a 16-bit port number 
that specifies, well, where's the local address on this machine that this data goes to? So for a web server, that port number is 80. Uh, for an email server, it's 25. Uh, at, on the destination, at least. So this is a picture of this. You have IP demultiplexing to TCP, and then TCP based on the port number is going to demultiplex to any number of the application processes that are running uh, on your machine. So there are two main protocols here. There's TCP and UDP. Uh, what uses TCP? Anything that needs reliability uh, uses TCP. So the web protocol, the email protocol, email access protocols, they're all layered over TCP. Uh, what uses UDP? It's protocols that don't care if you drop their packets. It might retransmit it, or it might say, I don't care what that packet is. I don't care that the packet is lost. So DNS is one of these protocols. DNS can actually use both TCP and UDP. Um, but uh, things like NTP, so the network time protocol, uh, the network time protocol is trying to synchronize clocks based on round trip times to an NTP server. And so if you get a packet that gets dropped with NTP, you just send another one, right? Like you don't care that much. You don't care about the data. All you care about is the timing. And so this, this is one of the protocols where you're like, yeah, why would I use TCP? I don't care about the data in that packet. Uh, the same thing with uh, video games. Uh, if you're doing a first person shooter, you don't care that a message got dropped because there's another update coming like 50 milliseconds after that. And so that's why you would use UDP for video games, because you don't want the retransmit lost data. You just you're you're quickly moving on to the next thing uh, for most video games. Uh, if you go into Etsy services on Unix or in Windows, it's in this file, you can see the different destination ports and their port numbers. So SSH is 22. The DNS port, the domain port is 53. Oh, I said SMTP is 25. You see HTTP is 80. It would be good for you to know these port numbers because um, they're they're very commonly used. This is the Samba port. Uh, well, part there's there's multiple ports that does that do the Windows file sharing, but this is one of them, 139. Um, yeah, those are the main ones. And 443 for HTTPS. Um, okay, so UDP. Uh, I'm going to cover it very quickly. It's the bare bones transport protocol. Uh, it's basically a thin layer over IP. All it has is the source port and destination port numbers to do the demultiplexing thing. And then it's just got a link and a checksum. So this is a very, very simple transport layer. Um, besides the demultiplexing, it doesn't do anything else. There's no connections at the UDP layer. Uh, there's no delivery semantics supported except for unreliable, unordered, and unicast delivery. There's no flow control there's no congestion control, and then there's no security. And so because of these two in particular, uh, at the beginning, UDP was the favored transport protocol for denial of service attacks, right? Like I just blast as fast as I can a whole bunch of UDP packets at a server, and then I just wipe that server off the, off the face of the internet immediately. And um, the, the UDP was used for the fastest spreading uh, internet worm ever. This is this, I think it was, because it was using UDP, it was a fire and forget infection. You just spray UDP packets at random IP addresses. And as soon as that 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 thing, this is the slammer uh, worm, if you wanna look it up. As soon as a, a machine that was vulnerable got that packet, it was infected. <laughs> and so it was the fastest spreading worm uh, of all time. Um, and so this is, this is, because it's using something that's uh, uh, that doesn't support any of these uh, things. Uh, most of the time, uh, you will be using services that are layered on top of TCP, which is the transmission control protocol. This is your connection-oriented protocol that is trying to give you a service. It's trying to provide a connection abstraction over IP, which is just datagram service. And so the abstraction that TCP provides you is a reliable in-order byte stream so that when the sender sends a certain set of bytes in a certain order, the receiver will get that exact same sequence of bytes. Uh, and then the magic of TCP is that it's gonna do all the retransmissions and the um, error checking underneath for you. Uh, so that's why all of these services are layered on top of TCP because as an application writer, I don't want to have to write that code that does that. 
I want to leverage someone else's code that does that kind of uh, operation. Um, and it does also do flow and congestion control, but that's not germane to uh, this class, so I'm not going to I'm not going to cover it. Uh, again, very minimal support for security, uh, and we'll see that this is going to be a, a problem. Uh, the way this gets implemented over IP is via a TCP header and an implementation uh, mm -hmm. that relies on these these uh, facilities that check some sequence numbers acknowledgements, explicit acknowledgements, uh, retransmission scheme for lost packets, and then rate limiting for the congestion control. Okay, so I'm going to briefly cover how this stuff gets implemented and then just uh, and let you go. Uh, so for TCP, if you're sending data and it gets corrupted, how does TCP identify that data has been corrupted? This is the integrity part of TCP, and it's really quite lame. They use a checksum. And they add up, they take the packet, and they treat it as a bunch of discrete numbers. They add it all up, and they attach that checksum as part of the packet header. They send it across, and the receiver recalculates that. And if the checksum matches, it says, no corruption. But the adversary is like, well, I'll just add one here, subtract one here. You get the same checksum, and that's, uh, that's your integrity check. So this is not a secure way of identifying corruption of data. So right off the bat, data integrity, uh, when it's done just by a checksum, not gonna work. But that's what we have, that's what we have at the TCP layer. Uh, so this is what it looks like. You have this checksum thing, basically treats your data as a, a, a collection of integers, adds them all up, does a mod uh, to make it a 16-bit checksum, attaches it in the segment header, and that's how you identify corruption. Um, okay, the next thing, what if the data is out of order? So again, IP does out of order delivery of your datagrams. And so if you send it in one order and then it gets scrambled, like get index.html, but these two things get scrambled, you don't want the receiver to get something bogus. And so one of the things that TCP adds are explicit sequence numbers that label the data going across. And so this is where you can see, okay, this is the first one, this is the second one, third and fourth. And so it really was get index.html. Uh, so this sequence number is attached to every segment that you send from source to destination. It's supposed to be unique, right? Because it is going to use this to establish the ordering. Uh, and uh, you have to figure out what sequence numbers you are going to use, and that's done via a handshake at the very beginning of the connection. TCP has this three-way handshake, and part of establishing the handshake, or part of the handshake is establishing the sequence numbers that the sender and the receiver on the other direction are using to label their data. And there's basically two sequence numbers, uh, sequence number sets one from the sender to the receiver, one from the receiver to the sender, because TCP connections are bi-directional. Okay, so knowledge of the sequence numbers are basically being used to determine authenticity, as it turns out. Source integrity is done by the sequence number, and if you know the sequence number, you can hijack a connection and inject bogus things. Um, and so we are relying on the sequence number being hidden to an adversary in order to make sure that the integrity of this connection uh, is set. Because these sequence numbers are being used to label the data going back and forth on this connection. And of course, uh, if you don't do this, uh, then you have an integrity problem, which we'll talk about, um, I think in the next class, I will talk about this because this is a, I don't have enough time to explain this well. Uh, so I'll stop here. I have a question. Mm. So, like the checksum, I've also seen files being assigned to the shot. So you would need a different mechanism. Yeah. And so this, uh, it makes no, I mean, the checksum is a crude way of detecting corruption. But yeah, you would need application layer. This is an end to end thing, right? You want end to end integrity. You need to sign that data. Um, with a key that uh, you trust, yeah. So that's not the same. Uh, layers, uh, checks, uh, 
that is a better that's a cryptographic checksum versus this which is just a regular uh checksum yeah yeah so that's why a mac uh, message authentication code or a digital signature is the way to do content-based uh, data integrity yeah 